here's the thing. I don't think theatre is a literal medium. Actors don't have to look like their characters. Sets don't have to resemble the locations that they're representing. A wooden chair can be a throne, a young woman can play an old woman. Uh, as the chorus says at the beginning of Shakespeare's Henry V, words can represent the battlefields of France. Um, audiences, I think, can be trusted not to take the stage literally, um, just as actors surely are people who can play people who are not themselves. Uh, writers don't have to write about themselves or their lives. The theatre is a place of imagination and playwriting is an act of imagination. I think this is true, but with one reservation, uh, which is not to contradict that thought, but just as a sort of corrective to it. It seems to be also true and unmistakably true that sometimes a certain directness, even a certain literalness, a transparency of representation is theatrically thrilling. When uh, Ibsen stopped writing poetic plays about turbulent theologians and philosophical trolls and turned his attention to ordinary, recognisable, scandalous daily life, he helped start a revolution in world theatre. We've all surely had those moments where you go to the theatre and suddenly for the first time on a stage you hear accents and sort of attitudes that you encounter all the time outside the theatre but I've never seen them in a theatre before or when a set designer kind of just takes that extra step and puts a, a space that we know recognisably so well on stage that we feel seen. Um, sometimes I think it is extraordinary when the theatre flings open the doors and kind of lets the world in. I felt all of this rather joltingly uh, in spring 2003 when I went to see Elmina's Kitchen at the National Theatre written by Kwame Kweama. Now, um, it, it won't surprise you when I say that this story of gun crime, black on black violence, gangsters and informers set on, in the West Indian communities of Hackney is not my life. Uh, obviously it's not my life. Uh, but it is the world around me. I'm a South Londoner, that's an East London play, but nonetheless, these are the voices I hear every day. These are the divisions and struggles of the city that I live in. And the play was completely captivating. Um, written like a thriller, but full of deep, compassionate sadness, as well as clear-sighted understanding and a really kind of rare balance. Um, and his two follow-up plays at the National, Fix Up in 2004 and Statement of Regret in 2007, revealed, I think, that Kwame Kweaba was painting an even more ambitious landscape of Black British life. Elmina's Kitchen, I suppose, uh, deals, you might say, with the underclass. Fix Up is set in a, a Black radical bookshop and it's interested in in the kind of autodidacts and sort of activist historians from below of Black British experience. While Statement of Regret moves fully into the centres of power, it's set in a think tank, absolutely kind of plugged in to, uh, to, to government, um, which is a kind of milieu he later exp explores again, interestingly, in 2009's uh, Seize the Day. These three plays, I think, were as significant a trilogy about uh, British life as David Hare's trilogy almost two decades earlier. What characterizes, for me anyway, Kwame's writing and gives it richness and, and depth is not merely that it offers a sort of forensically sociological account of ways of life that we don't often see on national stages, um, though that's pretty interesting in, it, in itself, but he always finds 
he always finds intensely personal stories that take us through those broadly social and political landscapes. He's particularly good at writing about fathers and sons. Um, three generations of fathers and sons are the character spine of Almina's kitchen. Um, in both Fix Up and Statement of Regret, the revolution, revelation of a lost child is a, is a key plot point. Um, in 2008's Let There Be Love, a father is estranged from his two daughters. And it's that estrangement that initiates a, a kind of personal and moral isolation that the play goes on to explore and break down. These relationships are fraught. They're always filled with resentment and responsibility, with love and grief. The portrayal of children and the portrayal of fathers hang heavily across these plays. The personal and the political keep interchanging and swapping places and fusing until a play like Statement of Regret. Uh, it's almost impossible to tell whether the ideas articulated by uh, Kwaku, the, the play's protagonist, are generated from sincere political conviction or from traumatic grief. And then because there are all these sometimes multi-generational parents and children, it means that Kwame is often writing about the old and the young in the same play. That's very characteristic of him, I think. And this starts to really build up an unusually strong sense, I think, of uh, generational inheritance. What do we owe our fathers, our forefathers? Um, my my kind of brilliant colleague Lynette Goddard has written that Kwame tends to be more interested in masculinity than femininity. It is sometimes fathers and daughters, more often fathers and sons. Their fathers are usually at the centre of the play. Women are, are, are somewhat more magical, magical, marg magical, marginal. But that said, what his lines of kind of ancestral succession start to do in their very scale, I think, is they bring history into the plays. I think we start, we sense that these characters are looking to their fathers and their father's fathers because they're seeking not just the personal, but the, the, the historical roots of the lives that they're living. Um, all of the plays address legacies of migration. Most of them specifically address the weight uh, uh, and impact of slavery. Um, in Elmina's Kitchen, the violence of the Murder Mile is in part seen as a symptom of Britain's slave-owning history. The Statement of Regret, the, the, the kind of traumatic acknowledgement of slavery, starts to turn characters kind of bitterly against each other in, and creates these kind of fascinating but kind of desperately traumatic schisms within, within kind of Black British communities. But that said, Kwame is not a, a writer who seems to think that these late legacies fatally weigh us all down. Um, he's actually a very hopeful playwright, I think. And his plays actually have sometimes, wait for it, happy endings. Um, I mean, most spectacular, I suppose, in his um, <clears throat> Bob Marley musical, um, One Love That takes uh, Marley through all the real travails of, of, of Bob Marley's life, assassination attempts, falling out with his band, the crumbling of his marriage and so on. Uh, but, but, but Kwame chooses to end it at the spectacular One Love Peace Comfort, uh, concert in Kingston, April 1978, at a time of vicious uh, political division at which he famously brought the leaders of Jamaica's warring political parties on stage together to join hands. Um, in Let There Be Love, we go from isolation and suspicion to the beginning of redemption, redemption and understanding. In a sense, his plays are all redemption songs. Um, and there's his play Statement of Regret, uh, which got very unfairly, I think, a bit savaged by the critics uh, at the time. It's a really daring complex, uh, uncomfortable play. It asks really hard questions and it offers no easy answers. Um, it starred the great Don Warrington as the head of this fictional think tank, um, the Institute of Black 
policy research, I think it's called, and it kind of takes him into hell. He's in grief and denial about grief at the death of his uh, father. And that grief pushes him into this particularly divisive position uh, that I mentioned. And he has a, he has a kind of meltdown on TV and his friends and his colleagues desert him. And I'm really interested in the ending of the play and I kind of, I'm really hoping I get a chance to talk to Kwame about it. But even if I don't, it's really interesting that in the national theatre version that I saw, Kwaku suffers a kind of collapse at the office. He's abandoned by everybody. And as the play ends, uh, he's left alone calling out to his dead father. And I remember kind of on the bus home, kind of looking at the text and and which obviously was published before the previews and actually there's a there's a bit more of the ending in the text where Lola who is Kwaku's long-suffering wife returns and and kind of bends down and cradles him in her arms and pledges to cleanse him and take him home and clearly uh, this moment of kindness and forgiveness and hope was cut during this previews. I don't know why. Perhaps the National thought the bleaker ending was a more authentic conclusion to that to that sort of character journey. Uh, maybe Kwame did. But it's interesting that when he adapted the play for radio two years later, he reinstated that more positive ending. The, it seems to me there is a light in Kwame's plays that that flickers but doesn't die. Um, Kwame's a major figure of the theatre of the last 20 years. I mean, he's, been a, he's a major figure in the culture of the last 20 years. Uh, but in the theatre, he's in, it been important as an actor, as a writer, as a director, uh, and, and most, most recently as the artistic director of The Young Vic. But uh, it's as a, as a playwright that I want to talk to him today. Uh, and I'm hugely looking forward to speaking to Kwame Kwayama. Dan. Kwame, how are you? I'm all right, mate, how are you? Yeah, not bad, not bad. How is, uh, how is lockdown for you? Oh, dear God, you know? Um, well, well, I mean, you know, there's Young Vic stuff, right? Which is, which is quite hard. Um, just dealing with all of that stuff. Uh, uh, for me, uh, you know, you know, I describe it often like this. When I was um, solely a writer, I'd often, I'd lock myself away for a month, wouldn't I? Upstairs, I wouldn't leave the house, you know, I'd bathe every other day while I tried to get away, while, while I tried to get through the, uh, through whatever uh, script I had in front of me. So uh, psychologically, I, I don't think that that, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm it, it's not affecting me, I don't think, because it feels very natural um, to me. Uh, in terms of dealing with the, you know, with the people that I work with at work and, and the future of theatre, or the immediate future of theatre, that becomes slightly harder. And, I mean, do you have, I, I, I'm sure the answer to this is no, but do you have any sense of what the, what the next year is? <laughs> no. The answer is, as you said, <laughs> As we sit today, no. I think there. I, I think there are questions, and I think there are. There, the, the the big questions are when. When will lockdown? When will we be allowed to socially gather? And then if people will want to socially gather, and 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 if so, in what numbers? And I think those will be the big. You know, those are the big questions that we're that we're. I don't know. We're we're concentrating on a lot on a daily basis, but, um, but it's hard, it's hard, you know. Do you have an answer? No, <laughs> no, I mean, okay. it sort of feels, I mean, the pessimist in me feels like they might be opening sector by sector, but the theatre might be the very last thing. That's not, I don't think that's the pessimist. I think that that's the realist, um, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's not gonna be number one. And again, most importantly, the longer we stay in lockdown, the more comfortable we become with lockdown. And, uh, and it's harder to, to, to kind of get in the habit of going out. 
so what, I, what I'd like to do in this uh, chat, if this is all right, is actually to bring you back to that time when you were mainly a playwright. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, for the first bit, I'd like to kind of just really think in quite general terms, ask you about how you have written your plays. And I guess the place to start is where they start, which is, is there a typical way in which a play has its kind of kernel or its seed? It, do, do you start with an issue or do you start with an image or is it a story idea or is it a character? Where would they? Invariably to... for me, it's an idea. I might be driving, I might be in conversation, I might be, and I, and I find, and, you know, that crack, that then it says, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that factoid is really interesting. Let's dive into that. Or, or that statistic is intriguing. Or that politician just lied. Why? Or, 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 that, or that, that language that was just used by that chief executive was very nuanced. And what's going on there? So invariably, it's, a, it's an idea that, 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 that it, it seldom comes out of, I have this central character that I want to write. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 I often find that I, 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 I create the character that can be the vehicle for the idea or for the natural vehicle for the idea, if that makes sense. Uh, or, and so then I find the character and the environment for that, the citadel to hold that together. And um, uh, so that's interesting. So you start with an idea and it sounds like it's, it's an idea it's not just a sort of inert idea, it's an idea that makes you curious, that makes you ask questions about it. Um, um, yeah. What, what would you kind of typically then do? How do you develop it uh, to the point where yeah. you're thinking about a theatre form? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think I do, I do a couple of things, right? I get the, or I, the idea hits me in some way, I go, oh, that's really interesting. And then I go, what is it? Is it a play? Is it TV? Is it a movie? Is it a podcast, you would say now? Do, do you know what I mean? Or, or in the old days, I'd say, is it an, an, an article? And sometimes I, I'm, I, to, t to kind of stress test it, I'll, the question I ask myself is, can I write this as, a, as an article? And will I feel satisfied that I've hit all of the nuances? And, uh, and if the answer to that is yes, well, then that's what it is, right? Then it's, 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 it's a provocation piece that I'll put down uh, over 1,200 words or something. Um, if, it's, if, it's, if it says no, it begs for um, a human interaction or a human manifestation, then I, then I knock out article or podcast and I go, well, it, it, it's, um, I, I go, I need, I, I need a character to carry this, to speak to this. Um, uh, so I kind of use that as a, as a bit of processing. Um, and, then, and then I write the idea down, and that's the big thing is writing the idea in whatever pad or, or device I have at the time, and then coming back to it the next day and seeing if there's still vibes on it, if it's still jumping off. Now, I used to be a musician, and, the, and what I would wake up in the night sometimes with a song in my mind, and I'd have a dictaphone next to me, and back in the day when that was, it tells you how long ago it was, and I would sing a melody line or a bass line, and then I'd come back in the morning and I'd listen to it, and invariably I'd go, I can't hear what I heard. I can't. And, and sometimes I'm like that where I write an idea down and I go, oh, I, 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 can't, I can't see what the crack was that makes me want to write 120 pages on it. But other times I absolutely do. And I go, oh, that's interesting. Are the vibes still jumping off it? And if they are, um, back in the day, one of the joys of being solely a writer was that I would stop everything else that I'm doing and ride that vibration, at least till I got 20 pages in. So I could go, oh, 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 yeah, I think there's something in it. And I'd go back to whatever I was writing before that, but, but I knew that I'd started the engine. That's really interesting. So actually writing would be one of the first things you would do. It wouldn't be that you go, I need to now do some research or build up some notes. You'd actually go straight in to the writing process. Yeah, it's why I'm so shit at writing treatments and outlines. Um, 
because <laughs> I kind of excuse it, excuse the terrible metaphor, but kind of don't want to do the foreplay bit. Do you know what I mean? I kind of I want to get in and 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 just start writing because ultimately, and this is probably because I was an actor before that. Um, I'm I'm I. It doesn't live for me until the people start speaking to each other. Um, and, and research, and I've had to do, uh, you know, I, I don't always write in that fashion. That's my preferred way of writing. Invariably, uh, in television and film, you, you know, you, you, you have to do the whole processes. And so I have to learn to kind of be able to extract from outlines and treatments in a way, but um, in a way that I do. But I, ultimately, I, it's, it's interesting, right? I had an idea, I don't know, yesterday, or it might be yesterday or the day before, and I just wanted to start writing. I just wanted to kick it off, and I, I absolutely could not um, with all of the things that are going on. And I kind of got a bit angry. I was like, oh, I really want to be able to, because I fear that if I come back to it in a month's time, the, you know, the, the bubble, the pop, the vibrations may not be there. But I, I do also write from a uh, research base as well, particularly when doing adaptations. And you, you, you said that obviously the kind of the germ of the idea is an issue that you're, you want to investigate. Would, would you say, this might not be a relevant question to you, but would you say that you therefore you're writing a play to express what you think about the idea or to find out what you think about the idea? If that makes I think sense. both. Both. I think that I should, when I go in, I should have an instinct that I'm, that I'm trying to, that I'm, an itch that I'm trying to scratch. That I, I should know, I'm going, my nose is telling me it's that way, but, but these other characters and these other uh, things are telling me, are questioning that very, that, that, that original thought, that original whisker. Um, and, and, and I figure by the time I get to the end, I should know what I feel about it. By the time I get to the end, and that end might be draft three, I don't mean immediately at the first draft, but I should know what question I'm trying to ask of the audience. I don't want to give them any answers, but I should absolutely know what question I want to ask them. That's really interesting. And then in the, it, it, so in the sort of total process of writing, I mean, you've said that there might be, you would sort of kind of dash through 20 pages just to, I guess, to see whether it has the energy you need or, or, or whatever. Um, would you then kind of just carry on doing that? Or would there be a process of gathering thoughts and, I don't know, planning and kind of thinking what is the sort of shape of this play going to be or do you do you write on instinct like that i i, I mean I, I, again i think it, it all depends on, on on the project and time available i would say that the overwhelming majority of things that i've been writing for the last six or seven years um have meant that i've had to um i've had to build it up from outline through to draft so absolutely and and much of it, I've had to do research, and I, I actually love research. Um, I love, um, I love the losing myself. I, I, I'm, I'm writing something at the moment, and, and I, you know, and I took two days off to read through an autobiography of a of a leading player at that period of history, and it was just like it was brilliant. My whiteboards are filled with just quotes of this of, of, of this intellectual, and this well, actually, it was a political intellectual, and. Um, and so I, 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 I love that. I love doing that process. But that for me isn't writing. What I love is, I love idea is born, thinking about who it is, thinking about who it is that I want, or what it is that I want to write about, and then diving in and being, and this can sound slightly pretentious and forgive it, but being spirit led, being led by the characters, that the characters lead me, particularly for the first draft because then I can put structure on it afterwards. I can tidy up the stuff, but my gut instinct, I want to, I want to come from my spirit or the, the restless curiosity spirit that sits in a storm. And, 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 I, and I wanna play, that's, that's when it's joyous, um, when I just go, let's go. And also when I don't write for anybody, when I'm just writing for me, you know? I, and in every commission I've had for theater, this isn't, the same for, uh, for film or TV. 
but nearly every commission I've had for theatre, where I've been commissioned, the play hasn't made it to stage. Where I have just written, it, 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 it's had a life. And have you ever used things like sort of development workshops as part of a writing process or is it much more you at your computer? Well, I, 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 it is, again, depending on, on, what the, on what the project is, but on the whole, certainly draft one, two, yeah, draft one and two, um, I like to be me and my computer. Um, then I love having readings, right? I love sitting with actors around the table and hearing it back and going into that development process so that I can go, okay, you know, the, the beautiful thing about an actor is, is that because they are three-dimensional human beings, um, that invariably, I love this, you cu I can cut three quarters of my lines, which are quite verbose, because the actor is doing it with their bodies. The actors are doing it with, with their eyes and the subtext is, is, is being... I, I think that's that's often a thing with my writing is that I write very subtextually and I discover that actually um, that reading that subtext is often quite hard. And so when I, I when I get an actor to read during that developmental process, I get to hear actually what is me going, oh no, that is subtextual. And what is me going, no, Kwame, that's just opaque. <laughs> it don't make sense to nobody but you. Um, so uh, yes, I use I use multiple ways of doing it i enjoy getting a second draft in front of an actor in front of actors and hearing it back and uh, of course um we're, we're talking about you as a playwright but of course you are also an actor and you're also a director and you're an artistic director and you're a musician and so on um i, I wonder particularly about the actor and director's side of you do you feel i wouldn't call myself anymore so that's all right <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you have been a musician but in terms of the actor director thing when you're writing do you try to keep the actor and director out of the room or do you feel like they're all working together on this play i think the best way for me to explain that is when i'm directing something that i've written i often say to the actors um listen the, the writer is not in the room and if you want the writer to come in the room you're gonna have to ask three times Okay. And so you'll have to say, I don't understand what this line means. What do you think? Well, I'm going to go, and I will go, I don't know. And they'll go, yeah, but no, go, no, I don't know. I don't know. Let's, let's find it out together. And, and then eventually, sometimes people go, all right, yeah, but as the writer, and I'll go, do we really want the writer in the room? And, uh, and they might go, yeah, okay, yeah. And then I'll give an answer. And invariably the answer would be, this is what my intent was, but it doesn't mean that now that it has interaction with three-dimensional human beings, that that is what uh, is needed. Um, I, I, I think most writers understand the beauty of creation is that actually you get credited with it, but it's not until you put it into the mouths of human beings and other eyes are on it. There's actually your 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 piece of work come alive and not be a solo pursuit but actually be something that collaboratively now is a piece of art uh, and, then, piece of and then and this might be a very difficult question really to answer but i suppose uh, I, i'll ask it anyway how do, yes. do you think there's a way in which your experience as an actor contributes to the way you write plays I think it does. Um, I, I think that, uh, that when I first started writing, uh, I remember my first place called A Bitter Herb. And I remember um, structurally not understanding, but wanting to, um, but really wanting to, to make every part equal. I went, because as an actor, I hate having a small role. So every role has to be huge and every role has to be, and getting a bit confused in the, at the beginning of that process. Um, but I would say that part of the reason I think I feel exhausted when I got to the end of a draft is because I'm, I'm, I'm reading it back and then I'm reading it back with my actors head on um, to see if that line of dialogue feels right or if that character feels full enough. I don't get to the end and view it through the lens of an actor, not at all. Nor do I get to the end and view it through the lens of a director, not at all. Those are for later. Um, but, but while I'm writing it, if I get to the end of the scene, I read back to see if it fits right in the mouth. 
to see if the sentence construction is 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 doable as an actor because i know what it's like when um a line is really bad or really badly constructed um uh, that that's really interesting when you're when you're writing when you're drafting uh yeah. are, is this is this um something that takes place oh a little bit a day over a long period or would you tend to write a draft in a fairly short intense burst of energy in a in a perfect world uh on the less on the less taxing world is a burst of energy right. that I, I i've got the idea i've given myself the dates to start writing and off i go and i just keep building and building in the in the kind of black heat of creation that i'm just i'm just going and um, and 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 I, I think it's because I I'm, I'm I'm relatively competitive with myself, and I'm a bit like, how many pages did you do today? And 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 how close are you to the end? But you don't know what the end is. And 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 I want to get to the end so I can just say to someone, yeah, I've got to the end. I know the end of a first draft means nothing. It just means you've got to the end. And but my process is is such that um that I kind of really want to get to the end so that I know the question I think I want to ask and then work out through later drafts if I am actually asking that question. And so, uh, and so in that process, uh, are, you, uh, are you quite sort of regular in your habits? Are you somebody who starts work at 10 and will work till four or do you like to work at night or is it a bit more sporadic? Um, uh, uh, I mean, my, as you know, because because I'm, I'm, I'm AD of the YV, uh, that sounded far too many, because I'm the artistic director of the Young Vic. Um, I mean AD of the YV of the Baba, come on. Um, uh, you know, my days are invariably, you know, I, I get to the office by you know, 9.30, 10 o'clock, and on a good day, I'm leaving at 7. And when we're close to production, I'm leaving at 1 a.m. Um, and so um, uh, I like writing at night, so that does me, that's absolutely fine. I, I can go and do a day's work and get home, sleep for a few hours, and then jump back in and work through till three in the morning or something and just kind of burn through it th that way. But I, I wanna keep the, I wanna keep the beat moving because I don't wanna, so yeah, yeah, I, I write in, mostly I write in the night, but I correct myself in the day. Ah, that's interesting. If that makes sense. So I'll just go, boom, follow it. And then I need to read it back during the daytime to go, oh, that line sounded really great. That move felt brilliant at 2 a.m., but it's actually a load of crap. And then, so I'll correct myself in the day. And, um, uh, uh, and now uh, going a bit into the, into the nuts and bolts of this, when, when you're writing a scene, are you imagining the characters as real people in a real situation, or are you imagining actors speaking these lines on a stage? Real people, real people right. in a real situation. Yeah, I can never think about, I can only think about the actor once I'm reading it back and, go, and thinking, does that line work, does that? But um, no, 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 I, I, whether the characters are positive or negative, or whether I, I love them or I hate them, well, in fact, I have to love them all. I have to find the thing to love in them all. I'm, I'm thinking about the real room, the, the real space. And going into real detail, uh, are you, do you handwrite or are you typing? I type. And here's the real question. What font does that ah, have? I don't, I, I don't give a toss. <laughs> whatever comes up. Whatever, right. uh, you know, whatever's there. I, 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 yeah, I, I don't think. I write in final draft. So it, there, I can't remember what one is. The, the font for that. So, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I don't think I even think about it. I don't okay. think I've ever thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is your first time I, thinking about. I know I will do now, though, right? And I go, oh, <laughs> what font means most to me? Who am I responding to the best? Um, and then, what about rewriting? Um, because okay. you know, rewriting, I think, is one of those skills that often happens later than learning how to write dialogue and so on. How, how do you approach rewriting and redrafting your work? Um, I, I, I love the rewriting process. 
there's a little bit of a lie in that. I think everybody wants to have the kind of an Alan Bennett like reputation that the first draft arrives and everybody goes, it's wonderful, bang, and you don't have to do any more. You know, I, I, I wish that was so. Um, and, and, and every first draft I hand in, I hand in thinking it's great. Uh, and then from the moment that I realized that it isn't, I love notes. And I want hard notes. Don't, 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 don't look after my sensibilities. It's what they're already in, they're already wounded because I didn't write a genius first draft. So once I, you know, once that's happened, I like, I mean, I'm the kind of guy that like notes, like the stuff that you wrote on the script when you were reading it for the first time. So because what, what the hell is this? Big crossing out makes no sense. I like those kind of hard, um, tell me it for real. Because I, because I, I, I want to be able to answer the question. I want to be able to go, no, I meant this. Or, oh, okay, cool. And then maybe I need to say it in this way in order to get through. Um, everybody says it, you know, writing is rewriting. Um, I, you know, I, have, I handed something in the other day, a, a TV thing, and, and uh, I struggled really hard with the notes. Like they were really, for the first time in a long time, they were, they were I, I, I wrestled with the notes. Um, normally, the, the kind of people we get to work with, right? They're brilliant. And so the notes are often brilliant. The notes are, oh yeah, I didn't see that. Or there's a bruise there, make that better. There's a, a bit of a hole there, I'll fill that in. So um, really my, my, and if I'm to get down to, to the nitty gritty of my rewriting process, it is give me my notes, give them really hard. Let me wrestle with them and, and, and think that they're wrong. Every single one of them is wrong then let me look at them the next day and immediately jump in. Invariably, I turn, I turn not always, but, um, but a lot of that, uh, maybe 60% of the time, who cares about figures? I will, um, I will hand in a redraft really quickly if I understand the notes. If I don't understand them, I'll say, let's get on the phone. Can we talk through these so I understand exactly what you want and then I'll turn it around immediately. Right. And to be really, really, um, um, kind of hyper specific. Um, I'm slightly dyslexic, so it means that there's always going to be spelling notes. There's always going to be uh, words missing. There's always going to be things badly spelt. So it means that most of the time I get notes back, and they, you know, they've told me all the big headlines, and then they go, and here are all the spellings. And it's a really easy way for me to warm up, to just go through the script, correct those spelling mistakes, put in those missing words, and then I'm into okay, I've started. I've got a sense of achievement that I've done something that's right. And then I'll go, oh, great, now let me deal with the big hard notes. And, uh, and what do you do? Because there must be times when you are given a note and you talk it through, but you still don't agree with it. What do you do in that situation? Um, you know, as an artist, period, I believe that the audience, and that would be the reader, is always right until I don't want them to be. Um, and so it means that the first time you give me a no, I'm going to try it. Right. Okay. Whether I hate it or not, I'm going to try it. Mm. And if I try it and it doesn't work, and you ask me for it again, I'll say, guys, I tried it. And I go, no, but I want to see it. And there, there was somebody, there's only one producer I've ever worked with who insisted that every single one of their notes I did. And, uh, and, and actually that relationship didn't work very well, very well in the end. But I try and respect the person giving me the notes by saying, I'm, I'm going to attempt every one of them. When I disagree, I'm, I, I'll write and I'll say, you know, you gave me 10 notes. I did eight out of 10 of them. And those two, I couldn't find my way through. Yeah, that's a very good way of saying it. Um, and um, writer's block. Have you ever had that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one that, isn't it? Because um, cause I think, I can't speak for anybody else, but um, I'm a firm believer in sometimes just type, you know, just type. 
Yeah. And I, I, I get writer's block with everything that I write, particularly when I'm writing something that doesn't have uh, an outline, that doesn't have a skeleton that I can follow. Um, you know, I open each day looking at the blank page and going, and when I write like that, um, organically, I try, uh, let's say I've got to the end of a writing day, and I try to just give a hint of where I think it may go next, so that when I come at it the next day, I've got something to look at and make a decision around, so mm. that I can then go, I like it or I don't. Um, but uh, I, th I think writers get writer's block on a daily basis. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just sometimes type and the writing will, you know, there's so many times, man, I've just done a d two, three days of just typing and not writing. And I look back at it and I go, it was all crap. It was all rubbish. Um, but, but, but it, it, it was about trying to get the muscles together. That's just the way it works for me. I don't know how it works for anybody else. Um, great. Oh, what I'd like to talk about a bit more specifically is mm. a player of yours uh, that I've always really liked. There's my prop, Statement of Regret, uh, which actually I've read in this version. All my props are coming out. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I want to talk about the f the differences, actually, between them, because I think that's really interesting, uh, the continued evolution of a play. But but where did this play start? Um, so I should, I should confess that, <laughs> that when I write a play, uh, after it's been produced, um, a little bit, and, and actually suddenly this is the first time I've understood where this has come from, the roots of this. As a, an actor, I would finish a show on a Saturday night, and if you asked me to go on next Wednesday, I probably would have forgotten all of the lines. Right. As a playwright, the moment that the first production has been produced, I about it and I don't even know the storyline. Uh, this has happened to me several times um, where um, I've gone to see a remount of something years later. I just don't know. Um, I, 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 I don't know what's going to happen. I don't, I don't remember what I've written and, and, and certainly I don't remember the character names, but the, I, I don't remember the, the story. So I have to say, that um, that similarly between like you may prompt something by telling me there's a difference between the published version and the and the and the, just the play text. I, I absolutely couldn't tell you. Now. I probably couldn't even tell you the storyline of Statement of Regret. Okay. But let me try and answer the question. Statement of Regret came out of um, the only time in my career ever that I had a title before I had a play. And Tony Blair had just made a statement of regret about the transatlantic slave trade and Britain's leading role in it. And, I, I, and friends of mine, um, I know, had negotiated to make that happen. Of course, we of the African diaspora wanted an apology. But for, again, you know, friends had lobbied Tony um, in such a way that Tony, like I know him, but um, in, you know, in a way that the best that we got was a statement of regret. And I found that fascinating. And I wanted to know what that meant. And so I began, and again, this is one that was written in like, you know, the black heat of creation. Just, just, I started to write it. And I wanted to, I, I, I I, I wanted to investigate a, a couple of things. And here's the thing that I knew absolutely when I went in. I described my three plays at the National as a triptych. Almina's Kitchen was set in the underclass. Mm. Fix Up, set in a black bookstore, was set in amongst the working class and the kind of organic intellectuals. And then Statement of Regret, I knew I wanted to be um, within the realms of the intellectuals. Um, you know, I, I, if we wanted to break it down into class, class, but so I knew that I wanted to put it in a think tank. I wanted to create uh, a, a citadel of ideas where ideas could be explored and fought. And 
And so that's where the play came from, is I wanted to explore this central statement of regret, what regret looks like in the lens or through the lens of racial politics at that time. Mm -hmm. And I still say, I got to the end of that process and I, I learned so much on that play. It's probably the play that I, that I, that, um, yeah, it's probably the play that, that, that has stayed with me, though I can't necessarily remember the plotting, stayed with me the most because it was the first time that I'd had a play savaged by reviews. And going in to it, nearly everybody that had read the play, actors, designers, artistic directors, nearly everybody had said it was my best play yet. And I believed that it was my best play. It was the play that was closest to me, closest to my world. Um, uh, and like Elmina's was huge research. That was a research project halfway through that. I didn't know the, the popular, uh, the, the speech of the young. I had to go and sit on buses and listen to it. To it. You know, I, I, I didn't know the, the, the world of the Yardi gangster. I had to go and speak to people that I know in order to kind of get it once I got through the first draft. And got, you know, I, whereas Statement of Regret, I didn't have to do that much research because I knew these people, I knew this debate, I knew the think tanks. I'd been, you know, I'd been hanging out at the IPPR. I'd been, I knew this work. And everybody, as I said, said it was my best play. And I believed it was my best play. And then it got savaged. And, um, and it stayed with me because the lessons that I learned from that play, it's probably why I became a director as well. The lessons that I learned was that um, I think I got a bit cocky. I got cocky in that um, I remember we had six weeks rehearsal and I wasn't directing, of course. In the first three days we did table work and I just talked and talked and showed off, not consciously, of course, about, you know, who does this and why I know that and what the connections and what the subtext is to this and what this and I just pontificated and wanked and uh, uh, and I and I I learned after that never to do that again. I probably gave all of the actors all of the answers without ever having um, without them having to do any real work, and um, and it, it taught me a life lesson. And. Um... Uh, again, uh, you may, of course, you may. If you don't remember the play or that well, you may not be able to answer this question. But one of the things you I should ask them anyway. Ask them anyway. It will prompt, and it will come back. Well, uh, one thing I think is really, really interesting about the play is that on one level, um, it's 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 a move to a slightly more public realm, sort of public political realm. I mean, yeah. I think Tank, I guess, is is a private thing, but it still feels like it's it's engaged in a very big public, it's about the news and the media and, and so on. Uh, yeah. But on the other hand, the play is also, is also very personal. So that yeah. I think still by the end, we don't quite know whether, whether Kwaku's advocacy of African Caribbean rights against African rights is genuine political conviction or it's the grief talking. Do you know what I mean? So there's that really yeah. interesting ambivalence between the, the personal and political. And I wondered, I wondered how personal the play was for you. Um, let me say, I'm not asking, I'm not prying. I'm more interested in how you, t if it was quite personal, whether there's a sort of self investigation in the play, how you turn that into sort of dramatic meat rather than just purely therapy. Um, I, there wasn't anything personal in the play in terms of something that I needed to investigate in myself. Okay. Um, I don't think, not overtly. There were stories from my life and observations from my, uh, absolutely. Um, I, 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 I think, but what, was, but what was interesting for me is that I, at, particularly at that time, I, I was in a unique position. The, we didn't grow up in a culture where there was such a term as African American or, you know, or African Caribbean, we're going to went Afro Caribbean, but there was still a major schism between our two communities, certainly growing up. And by the time I, I'd reclaimed my ancestral name, as we say in the trade, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and because I have very clear Ghanaian features, mm. um, you know, I, 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 I was riding the middle. You know, in, on, in both negative and positive. On the negative, the Caribbean community would say to me, why are you trying to be African? 
uh, the Africans don't like us, like with a V in front of them. And, uh, and, the, and I'd be with people who knew me professionally and where you've met me as Kwame and, and, and all communities that may have seen me on the television, blah, 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 and, and saw my name and saw my features and perceived that I was um, solely from Ghana who would speak about why would you, you know, all those Jamos, those West Indians, they're not educated and that they're uncivilized. And, and there was this kind of debate that I would, this kind of duality that I was living at the time and that both communities would almost deny. Um, and that's where the denial in the play comes from, yeah. that they would deny that they felt that way because they wouldn't speak that way if, I were, if they knew I were West Indian. They wouldn't speak that way if there was someone that was African in the room, um, unless it came out of, of conflict. And so in, in a way, I was fascinated with investigating the things that we push under the carpet. And I profoundly believe that, um, that everything comes back and bites us in the ass if you don't look after it properly. If you don't put it in the air and debate it and smooth it out, it just comes back to bite you. I would call Trumpism nothing but, and, and, and where we were, were with Brexit, is nothing more than we've just, we, the progressives, thought that we had won battles when actually we had only won the silence and suppressed it. And then it comes out with a with a, a, a kind of with a with a nastiness sometimes or, or that that we just don't recognise. Um, and so, and let's not say that every Brexiteer was nasty or that every Trump sport is nasty, but it is that it, that the energy around it can sometimes come out in a, in a way that that has aggression attached to it when we thought that we'd gone past it. So right at the heart of the play was 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 the question: Why are we hiding? And what are we hiding? And there was a central, uh, the bit, not the bit, but one of it that I'll never forget was a scream that Kweku does, and I think it's somewhere in the second act, where there's a discussion about the difference between Africans and African Caribbeans and, and how reparations would be applied and who it would be uh, applied to. And, and, and Kweku says something like, if you loved us so much, why didn't you come back and find us and get us and rescue us and, and from, the, from the demons of, of European slavery. I, I don't remember the lines exactly, but I remember. And um, every time Don would, would say that line, um, I would feel it in, at the core of, of me. It doesn't mean that I agreed with the logic, but I felt it right at my core. So to answer your question, that was a really long way around, but to answer your question about was it a denial play, or was it a play that was about the ideas of reparation? Did it come out of a sense of division or of hatred of, African, of Africans, as it were, or people directly from the motherland, from his West Indian lens? I would say that it was his grief speaking, but it wasn't permanent. It was, it was out of the pain of realizing all that you have lost. And the step after that is, is reunion, is a, a, a reunion that has nothing hid under the carpets, nothing unsaid, even where you go, okay, I now know you, you know me. Mm -hmm. And now let us not falsely create a union, but let us, let us create a union that, is, that, is, that understands our histories. And, 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 you know, and, and as an African Caribbean, I did perceive that we are an ethnic group of the African family. And there are many ethnic groups in the African continent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but but I wanted to investigate that. I think um, uh, that's that's really interesting, and that bears on the different endings, which uh, you you haven't you, you may not remember. But uh, can you tell me which end, which one, which is in which is which? But actually, do you know what? I think somewhere I may no. Can you? I I I, I don't know if I have that. If, you know what? I'm going to find it. I think I I think. Okay, give me a second. Uh, uh, oh. Okay, good. I've got one of those, and but I don't have the I don't have the the, the play text. I should have done. I should have done this, shouldn't I? Before I should have, <laughs> and I should have. I should have. Um, 
But I think, no, I, th I think the other one might be downstairs. So I won't bore you and run and get that. Well, now. But you can tell me the difference in that one. And I, can, I think I can tell you the stories about how they became. Well, actually, how they you've got two different endings in, yeah. this, in this one. Because oh, you, how have I? You rewrote the <laughs> ending for radio. Uh, and what's interesting yeah. is, so the, the, the stage version that you've got here ends, in a sense, without that reunion, because it ends with Kwaku talking to his dead father. Yeah, but in the radio version, Lola then comes in and sort of cradles him and promises ah. to take him home. God, you can tell that I'm not lying, right? <laughs> I literally have never read this. It's like, I, you know, I, I've, never, I've never, so I don't actually remember that, that well, I say never uh, after it was submitted, that there was an alternative ending written in. That's absolutely right. So this end, just so I'm clear, the end without the alternative ending is the same as in the single play text. But in here is the radio ending. It's slightly yes. more complicated than oh, that, oh. weirdly. Then, 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 don't, worry about, don't worry about that. Um, oh. So here's, here's what I can tell you. <laughs> this is so hilarious. Um, here's what I can tell you. Is that in the, um, we, during previews, which I think is absolutely right, Previews are there to test with an audience. And I think we were getting people saying um, with the ending that had uh, Lola come back, that people were saying that it didn't feel like it ended dramatically well. That it ended, that, that, that. And so, I, I, so we got note, we got a note that I agreed with at the time during the production to, that it was a more dramatic ending to have Kweku screaming at his father and that felt more thematically right. Now do I think that that that, that Nick who gave us the note, Nick Heiner, gave us the note at the time, um, I, 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 I did believe in the note but I also think that he was trying to solve a problem of a play that wasn't landing right. Um, by the time I, I, I got to doing the radio play which got a completely different reaction and set of reviews than the stage play did and I would wager one was because when the play came out in 2007 it was pre-Obama when it came out in, uh, in 2009 as a radio play, it was during Obama, and the notion of black intellectuals and black think tanks in Britain became something that we understood. We knew who that black man was, and we didn't know who that black man was in 2007, according to the reviews as reported to me. Um, but I wanted to go back to that. I wanted to go back to the original healing, which was his wife coming back and saying, um, I now need to pull that spirit of negativity from you. I need to heal you mm. and you, you will be healed and we will, we will go back home and heal together. So that was a really a big missing element out of the, the one that was on at the National. I'm so glad you reminded me of that. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, one uh, thing I think is really uh, interesting. One of the many things I think is really interesting about this play is, uh, in terms of the, the three plays for the national, um, I think in broad terms, very broad terms, it would be true to say that they are mostly sort of realistic, in the sense they, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's a really interesting device in this, which is the character of Sobi, yeah, uh, who is the who we meet once in the first act. And I think we just, I think we maybe, I certainly did. I assumed it was Lola's father. And then only at the very end of the play do we realize it's a hallucination or a ghost or something. I, this may be taking you back to something you just won't remember, but do you remember how that idea came to you or was that very instinctive? I, I think it was instinctive and I would say um, it was right at the core of the idea because um, I had lost my mother two years before that. And so the notion of having a debate with an ancestor past um, was right all, all over me. And so um, right at its core, I knew that he, he had lost, he was, he was dealing with grief. And that was what catapulted him into, um, in, into the state that he was in. And I knew it was grief because also the five stages of grief, as we're told, is kind of roughly the acts of the play. Um, yeah. 
So I, 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 I and I would, and I would say also negotiating with and putting the spirit into a piece. Um, the only piece, and then I can't really remember correctly if there is anything like that in Fix Up, but in Elmina, Elmina has a, a, a prologue that yeah. wasn't uh, at the beginning of Act One and Act Two that actually wasn't produced at the National because um, on the whole, um, it wasn't felt that it would be understood. When I've seen the most powerful productions of Elmina, one was in Brixton Prison with many who were who were from the Caribbean and Africa in it, and they opened up with the spiritual prologue. Um, uh, it, they understood it intuitively, and uh, and 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 made it work. So, in an in an odd way, you would be right to read that and see that. But um, but I've always slightly played with a sense of the spirit. Um, in, and no, I think you can fix up as well. There's a sense of spirit. But you're right. By and large, in nat then naturalistic plays that are infused with elements of spirit. And then um, uh, one thing I wanted to uh, ask about, which I think possibly relates to the fact you're an actor, there are, uh, there are stage directors in uh, Statement of Regret that I think a playwright who isn't an actor wouldn't do because they'd be wary about treading on an actor's toes. <laughs> do you have an example of one? Well, no, things like, right at the beginning, Kwaku slowly stops what he's doing and looks towards the computer. It's as if a dark cloud has suddenly descended. He pauses for a moment, unsure quite how or what to do. He moves quickly to his computer, switches it off. Still unsure what to do, he lets his head slowly fall till eventually, even though he's tried not to, his eyes begin to swell. They're, they're quite... I mean, you're giving the actor a, a lot. And I think... A lot, I think what a, a, a playwright who isn't an actor might kind of go, I can't... Uh, the actor has to find that out for themselves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point, and you're absolutely right on that. I think one of the things I learned from Angus Jackson, who's the director of Armina, um, was that most directors, and I wasn't a director, but most directors um, pick up a script, and when they go into rehearsal, say to the actors, now let's just strike all the stage directions, and let's find it ourselves. And yeah. so in an odd way, um, m my job is to let you know exactly what I'm thinking, what you choose to do with that is, is up to you. And invariably, with really classy actors and classy directors, they invariably do something that I never even thought was possible with a line or with a bit of stage direction. They actually augment it. For me, this, uh, when I, and I do overwrite stage directions because I'm, I'm, I'm desperate to make sure that I'm saying this is what I'm thinking as a baseline, then you go do what you need. Okay, that's and that's also what I'm also interested in. Though this is slightly different, is the way you specify music. Um, yeah, there's the there's lots of aswad in it and yeah. uh, so on. And is that again a suggestion, which is the, the sort of saying, "This is what I was listening to. This is the mood I've got in my head," or are you actually a bit more? No, I want to have aswad in this moment. I'm somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I'm in. I don't need you to actually do this, but I need you to understand the sonic vibration yeah. that this adds and contributes to this scene. Yeah. So if an Adward bass line goes boom, ba bum, ba 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 bum, ba ba bum 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 bum, ba bum ba bum 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 ba ba ba, right? That's that's a song called Warrior Charge. That means right at the beat of that is a warrior beat that gets your heart racing, that makes you feel militant. I, I'm giving you the closest thing that made me feel that way. You might then give it to a composer and say, I don't want to use Aswad, but I want to use, but I, 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 again, it's baseline. And, yeah. you know, I, 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 I believe in, in the complicity or the trinity of, of, of theater in that it exists on an aesthetic level, on a sonic level, and then a spiritual level. Right. And, and, and in order to get to the spirit, you've got to get the sonics right. And you've got to get the aesthetic and the truth right. Hmm. Okay, and this is my last question. Okay. You've been writing plays for just over 20 years now. What have you just under? Yeah. 
<laughs> I think your first play was late nineties. Yeah, the no, no, my but what was it? Oh yeah, my first play. You're right. Damn, my first play was two thousand and one produced. That means I wrote it ninety nine. You're right. Yeah. Yep. What have you learnt? What can you do now that twenty years ago you wouldn't know how to do? Okay. Uh, a really, really, uh, a really, really interesting question. I'm just going to turn my um, my computer around for a moment. I don't know if you can see it, but there, I'm just going to see, is a poster of a RADA production of my first play, A Bitter Herb. Can you see it? I can. All right, great. So, um, as I said to you before, um, once I've written a play, I've forgotten about it. I don't really know what the plotting is. Even though we've talked thematics of statement of regret, that's, I can remember the thematics. You couldn't, uh, I couldn't tell you what scene followed what or what the story was on the whole. Um, so Rada reached out to me and they said uh, they were doing a production of, of A Bitter Herb, my first play. And uh, would I come and see it? And it just so happens on the very last day before I was going back to, to Baltimore, I was directing something in, in Birmingham, I got to see the production. And I was very, very nervous about it. I was nervous because I went, I'm gonna go meet my younger self. And I'm, you know, all of the holes, I'm gonna see all the holes. And I'm, and I know at the time I thought it was great. And, and you know, now I'm gonna see that it was all an illusion. And, and, and you know, I, 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 you know, and God, does that, how does that make me feel about today? And, you know, I, I mean, I was, I was, I was, I was, a, I was a mess, an unusual mess for me, actually. I was, I was really nervous about going in. And I sat and I watched that play and it changed my life. It changed my life because I saw a younger, bolder writer. Someone who didn't, who didn't call compromise pragmatism. Someone who said it as they felt it. It was my first play, I didn't know, I just wrote it. And I went, I really said that. I really, I really, sh and I found a bolder, stronger self than I had grown with to, to be and persuaded myself that this was um that somehow i was i was more mature or somehow i was i was better so um I, I, to answer your question uh I, I don't know i start every project not knowing if i can write it i start every project going am i as good as the one before is it you know to, uh, for me and for others um i i i i i after seeing a bitter herb i literally quit my job two days later in baltimore because i went I, I went listen are you feeling that you yeah be bold don't 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 be that guy <laughs> don't be this this new guy um uh and and so i, I I can't answer. Are there technical tricks I can do? Yeah, of course there are. You know, do, 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 I, do I understand, you know, three act structure in a way that I didn't then? Doesn't mean that I'm good at it, but you know, do I, do I, yeah, yeah. Am I able to write five things at the same time because I have a toolkit? Yeah, yeah, all, all of that. Um, but, but actually now, I, 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 you know, does that match up to, the raw, and I mean raw as in R-O-A-R, -R, that I had um, when I first started writing. Um, I don't know. And what a lovely way to end. Thank you so much for your time. That's really generous. Oh, you. Thank you so much. And I hope the rest of lockdown is okay for you and that we get the young Vic back in yeah. our Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you for introducing me to you or reminding me of the alternate end of a statement of regret. And that we actually did that. That's like hilarious. It's the only one of my plays that hasn't had a, a stage, uh, a, a second or third production of. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it, you know, it, 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 so whenever people mention it, I always feel very fond. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it has fond memories. It, 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 it taught me a lot. So thank you for taking me back there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Quams. 
Thanks, sir. Peace and love, y'all. Cheers, Annie. Bye.